what's happening in terms of human rights in Afghanistan and also beside that the humanitarian crisis have been day by day increasing. So Afghanistan needs big attention of the international community at the current moment. For the people of Afghanistan who are inside Afghanistan, those who did not have opportunity, it's hard for them to keep their hope and faith with the current regime. So day by day, they're finding different avenues. They're trying to find different ways of fleeing the country, which is really concerning for the future of the country. But at the same time, most of the people who are remain there, so it's hard for them. So they have to live what's already there. So for them, sometimes I say that it's a hard choice because if you don't have any way, if you have no way of survival so you have to survive with what's already there you have to at least if i say that you can adjust yourself but you have to somehow live until you see a hope for the change we're lost for a whole life and nothing but less makes people jump out of a comfortable pond into an unknown ocean welcome to that journey between the east and the West. Who says Rolling Stones don't gather moss? Hello everyone. I am Meenu Gupta, your host for the day, and I'm delighted to have you join me every week as amazing people share their incredible and inspiring life stories of straddling continents. Thank you. You, like many other people in the world, only have information that is filtered by the media, said a taxi driver to me a year ago in Germany. He was originally from Afghanistan. As our conversation rolled on, he expressed how happy he was that the foreigners had left the country. How would Germans feel if Afghans were governing their country? How would Americans feel, he declared very emphatically. Okay, what about education of girls? I believe they're not allowed to go to school, I asked him. Who said that? You all believe what the media tells you. Girls pursue education in a better way than before, he said. I was stunned. For a minute, I thought that perhaps he was part of the Taliban group. I kept quiet, but not today. Because today I have a guest who was born and brought up in Afghanistan and now lives in Canada as a recent refugee. Ajmal Ramyar serves as the executive director of Afghans for Progressive Thinking, which is APT for short, a youth-led non-profit organization in Afghanistan. APT has been at the forefront of addressing human rights crisis and promoting girls' education. Ajmal also led the Afghan Youth Representative Program to the United Nations advocating for Afghan youth on both national and international platforms. After the Taliban's takeover in 2021, Ajmal relocated to Canada. There he continues his efforts to empower Afghan women by connecting them with international mentors and advocating for their educational rights. Dear listeners, since the Taliban regime, or let me say regain of control, it has been reported that girls have been prohibited from attending secondary high schools as well as universities. It is also said that the situation for women and girls has continued to deteriorate, particularly after the ban on women's rights to employment in December 2022. Today with Ajmal, we will get to hear the ground reality in Afghanistan and also how his life has shaped up between the East and the West. Welcome, Ajmal. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. What was life like in Afghanistan 10 years ago and how is it now? So let me put it this way. Um, probably you could share a bit of your life story or all of it. I leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. So for me, my aspiration and motivation to advocate for education and also for a culture of peace in Afghanistan stares from my personal experience, both as a child and as an adult, raising, uh, born and raised in a war and conflict country like Afghanistan. 
Pakistan. I have witnessed the inequalities and injustice that was ruled in Afghanistan. Uh, during the first rule of the Taliban uh, in 1996, uh, when the Taliban took control of Afghanistan, for the first time, my family was forced to flee Afghanistan and seek refugee in Pakistan because on that time, my sisters were not allowed to attend schools. Like my sisters, millions of girls who were denied access to education during the first era of the Taliban, uh, they could not pursue their dreams. When we uh, seek refugee in Pakistan, I started my school. I, I studied till fifth grade. And then while we had, or my sisters had the privilege to continue their education in Pakistan, uh, millions and millions and millions of girls in Afghanistan did not have that privilege. They were confined to their homes and deprived of learning opportunities. Upon I uh, returned to Afghanistan in 2001 after completion of my education. I continued working for different nonprofit organizations and then I started my efforts leading the Afghans for Progressive Thinking. During uh, the Republic, even though in a country like Afghanistan, there has been always a challenge, especially when you're involved with advocating for education and for inequalities because of the traditional barriers, the challenges, and also because Afghanistan was a male-dominant society. The work that we were doing during the Republic, it has many challenges and risks, but we had so much progress. We had different activities. We were involved and we had progress uh, both uh, nationally and also regionally and internationally. In 2021, when the Taliban takeover of the country for the second time. We were forced to flee Afghanistan because of the work that we were doing. It also put my family at risk, which we had to leave our home country. And for my family, that was a hard decision to, because uh, they have to leave uh, their loved one behind. And uh, many other people still didn't have the opportunity. But despite these challenges, my aspiration has been become more clearer. And my the difficulties that I have uh, experienced and through my personal experience now I have been strengthened and I remain committed to continue my advocacy work and ensure that we'll have the opportunity to continue learning and advocating inside and outside of Afghanistan. So what I understand is since 2022, you and your family are all in Canada. Am I right? Yes. Since the takeover in 2021, we have been relocated to Canada and I'm living with my family in Canada. Okay. And uh, what is Afghanistan beyond the headlines? So one of the biggest issues that since the takeover of Taliban, the education system of Afghanistan is completely failed. The current regime, the policies that they have put in have severely impacted the lives of millions of women and girls. And besides that, the girls and women could not have any opportunities in the public in terms of employment, but the biggest impact has been that they are out of school and university. Uh, the number of girls and women who attended education uh, institution has fallen to zero. And it's it's not just that they cannot go to school and university, but their entire way of life has been restricted. And what about the impact on men? Yeah, so this is, of course, that banning schools for girls and uh, women has uh, impacted the male campaign also, for, for example, for most of those who are at home. So they are feeling really disappointed that they cannot do anything to change seeing their sisters, their mothers, their family members have been restricted from all the public areas of the life. So this is also affecting negatively, but also at the other points that if the male has this opportunity to go to school, the university, but there has been lots of other restrictions for how they are living their life inside Afghanistan. So so they have no control, even if they are a male, but they have no control, for example, on what they wear, how they are like looking, what they should do, what they should not do. So this has also put uh, big restrictions on the male in, in Afghanistan also. 
Oh, I didn't know that there are restrictions on males for wearing clothes and other areas of life. Yeah, so f- for example, like the biggest issue with the education system in Afghanistan, that boys in school in other education systems are at risk of being taught extremism. With the educational restrictions, most of the universities and schools are now being taught by the current regime. So they are changing the curriculum for most of the educational system. So that has negatively impacting even the boys in the school and in other educational system also. That's interesting, actually. I didn't think about the other side. Let's say if the regime changes, would you and your family go back to Afghanistan? This question might be a hard question for hundreds or thousands of those families who have fled Afghanistan because they knew that leaving Afghanistan would be not the only option for them because there has been families who left their beloved ones, families who have their immediate family currently in Afghanistan. So of course, I'm sure I have talked with hundreds of Afghans who are now in different countries. If I say that for many Afghans, that might be the hard this Asian because most of the families who came, they have left everything and now they have nothing to go back for. Like, And it's also for most of the people, those who have been evacuated to different countries, they have started again their lives from zero. So that might be also a hard decision for them to go back. But of course, even for me and for my family, for anyone who I know and who I have talked with, they really want to go back and the, the work that they are doing, so they are still continuing to change what's what's happening in Afghanistan to do that the people in Afghanistan should have all their rights, should live a peaceful society. For a large number of years, you are quite young. So you were there also during the time when the Americans were there, the military. How was life like then? Yeah, if I say like in a country like Afghanistan, uh, change never has been an easy. Even during the republics, many people, youth have been really struggling to get their opportunities. But there has been lots of progress with the existence of the international community, both for uh, women and girls in terms of like their education, in terms of their employment. There has been significant progress uh, for all areas of the lives and people uh, uh both in the rural and urban areas and they had made much achievements and gains even though these gains and achievements have been not easy for them because many people have lost their lives during the republics there were war and conflict ongoing conflict in the country Uh, but of course there has been lots of progress in terms of human rights, in terms of education in terms of like the people who even if we are talking about like after the first rule of the Taliban there has been lots of progress. Women and girls had the opportunity to take a key leadership positions. Organizations such as EPT and others organizations were involved to advocate and to ensure that the people and the youth have voices in decision making process and could reach the policy makers to have their concerns and demands reached to them. During the time when the American military was there, it seems some semblance of normal life with administration, education, and so on. However, the image that a lot of people outside Afghanistan have is also that because of the presence of military and the other elements, the constant presence of violence, war, bombs dropping, etc. was also a normal feature. Is that true? Yes, of course. Uh, One thing which was really hard for the people of Afghanistan during the past 20 years with the suicide attacks, with the conflict and war that were happening, most of the people were somehow used to it. But at the same time, people were really, really uh, tired and they were really thirsty for peace. They were always hoping that when we will have see a day that we cannot hear any bomb, we cannot hear any any suicide attacks. 
So people were really tired. Most of the people were, even though during the past 20 years, they were sending their children to different countries. Just they wanted them to be safe and they were less risking their lives to illegally go to uh, third countries and to spend their lives there. So that was a big problem for most of the families. But at the same time, people were struggling and convincing to help government. They, they were they were hopeful for peaceful society. So they were working alongside of other people within the government to see a day that there will be no war and no conflict. What I understand, therefore, is that the feeling of security was still not there because of the presence of background presence of constant violence. However, the people had hope. Yes, uh, one thing which was really concerning for the people of Afghanistan, because in the past 20 or 15 years, beside that people had um, somehow physical independency, but at the same time, they were not mentally feeling safe. So even with the existence of the international community or other countries that they were fighting toward Taliban or any other regimes that we were fighting with, in the government. So people were not feeling safe. Many people have lost their lives. Just they wanted to keep the, the era for peace and they were hopeful for a peaceful Afghanistan. Where were you living in Afghanistan? So I was living in Kabul. So I'm originally from Wardak province. So it's far from Kabul. It's like two hour drive. But during the Republic, so my province were under control of Taliban. It was hard for us and for my family to travel there. And life was a bit more normal, relatively. So if I say like even the, during the Republic, so life for the fair, like for example, in most of the provinces, uh, people did not have opportunity the same that as someone, for example, in capital of Afghanistan could have. Like life in the most of the provinces were really, really hard for many people. They were struggling, for example, to have that opportunity that many other people could have, like in, for example, in some other provinces that, that there were like more opportunities. But again, as I said, that day by day, we were seeing progress. For example, the government, which did not support in some of the provinces, so they were those provinces where the people were standing and they were raising their voices. And the change were coming day by day. So it was not easy because Afghanistan had passed many other conflicts. Uh, even if I say that internal conflict was also one of the reasons for people that they were struggling uh, because the opportunities were not distributed equally between the people of Afghanistan. So most of the opportunities were being grappling by a number of people, specific people, so that opportunities were not somehow equally accessible to everyone. Would you say that the people in the Taliban regime are themselves educated? Of course, if we see the background of the most of the high-ranking officials of the Taliban, their family members are still outside of Afghanistan. They have got education in some Arab countries. So, of course, they themselves have been educated. They're, even their female member of their families are educated and they have studied abroad. So, this is not that they... The only thing that this is also a question for millions of people of Afghanistan that why they are restricting and controlling the people of Afghanistan, the female and the young women and girls of Afghanistan, if, they're, if they don't want that uh, restrictions on their own family members. So it's interesting. Now that is very interesting. The family members of the regime, they've also been educated abroad and they've also come back. Do I gather right? In terms of like some of them have brought their families after the takeover of the Taliban. So now they are living inside Afghanistan, but uh, most of them, I think they are still, they have their houses, they have their lives outside of Afghanistan. And according to you, from whatever the source of knowledge, why is there this ban on education for women or normal rights for them to work, etc.? Why would the Taliban do that? If I say this, that I think this is not the reason that in most of the cases they are bringing the issue of the Islam 
and the Sharia laws are preventing women and girls from going to school or employment. They are claiming that these education system, which is currently exists in Afghanistan, it's a Western broad system. The way that they are mentioning, they say that this is prohibited in Islam, but I and many or like millions of other people, they know that this is not the case. They are just using the name of Islam for prohibiting education and also not letting women and girls to be exist in public. So if I say like currently with all the restrictions and policies that they have put on girls and women, they have totally erased women and girls from the society. But the case is that they want to control women and girls, like the whole population they want to control and they want to get their own interest from this to show to international community and we have saw in the past three years everything they have said have proven wrong the way that they have promised on the deal in 2019 in Doha so they have broke all those promises and they have not committed on what they have agreed on what I understand is the people then who are there right now in Afghanistan includes the Taliban regime. Some of them also having been educated abroad and come back. And the other people are essentially the people who had no choice, who could not leave. Now, having said that, what would the future then look like? Or what is the future sitting now where you are sitting of Afghanistan, of the country where you were born? What does that look like with the present regime continuing? Just a thought. If I say like in the current situation, because we see that there are also beside the biggest challenges in terms of education for girls or women and their uh, rights, there is also an ongoing human rights crisis happening. The current regime with all the restrictions and limitations that are putting for the people of Afghanistan, I'm sure that they will not sustain like this. And the people of Afghanistan is struggling and they are continuing continuously raising their voice, both in Afghanistan and internationally. Those who are outside of Afghanistan, they are finding different ways of advocacy and to raise voices from inside Afghanistan to international community. Because still the current regime is, for example, have connection with outside. They are still are in negotiation with the international community, with the U.S. and their accountability is the most important for part for the changes that could come in the coming months or years. Because the concerns for both uh, what's happening in terms of human rights in Afghanistan and also beside that the humanitarian crisis have been day by day increasing. So Afghanistan needs big attention of the international community at the current moment. For the people of Afghanistan who are inside Afghanistan, those who did not have opportunity. It's hard for them to keep their hope and faith with the current regime. So day by day, they're finding different avenues. They're trying to find different ways of fleeing the country, which is really concerning for the future of the country. But at the same time, most of the people who are remain there, so it's hard for them. So they have to live what's already there. So for them, sometimes I say that it's a hard choice because if you don't have any way, if you have no way of survival, so you have to survive with what's already there. You have to at least, if I say that you can adjust yourself, but you have to somehow live until you see a hope for, for the change. I heard an activist say the following words, the whole world has turned its back on us. What do you feel about that? Yes, through my own experience, through my own involvement in different events and gatherings, I saw that the international community is taking their attention away from Afghanistan. And that's really concerning because this would give more way for the current regime to put restrictions and to do human rights violation, which is really concerned for hundreds and thousands and millions of people in Afghanistan because their all hope and 
and they're all there seeing toward what the international committee or what's the those who are really committed for the human rights they believe in the human rights what they are doing for them the problem that i foresee or i see right now foresee something else which is about the future in the present scenario where the world is finding itself right now Afghanistan, Sudan, we have Israel, Palestine, the Gaza Strip, the genocide going on, Ethiopia. Actually, it's horrendous what is happening in the world, when I say in a collective way. The strange part is in the so-called safe countries where people live without the fear of bombs falling on them. For example, you're in Canada, you wake up, you don't hear bombs falling around you. It's different. So people are unable to see life at the other side. And at times I wonder, how do you feel right now in Canada? So you've lived through the other regime or let's say when the American military was there, you were there when the Taliban took over. How do you feel in an everyday life just as a normal human being? What is it like waking up in Canada? Which city are you in? So I live in Hamilton Ontario and even in the past 3 years for me life was if I say if I had the privilege of being with my family here but day by day the situation that uh, we hear from Afghanistan because we have lived there like my whole life my family members and I have my families my relatives my colleagues and the work that we are doing we could not like stay calm to see uh what's happening there and if i say that if i don't hear the voices of bombs and anything else uh, uh while i'm here but at the same time i still dreamed of my whole aspiration my whole motivation that i had when i was in afghanistan and the changes is, is not easy if i say that for me this past 3 years have been really hard in terms of like accepting what has happened why it's happened why what we have lost and to build up on everything to start everything on scratch it's not easy sometimes i feel it might be impossible for many people to accept that they are in a country even though that they had the opportunities but they cannot integrate well and i see this within my family so for my parents it's much harder and i accept it like in the first few months that we have arrived in canada i was convincing and motivating my parents to accept what had happened but later on i haven't like i have stopped as telling them that it's okay what had happened was something that was not under control of us but accepting those realities could be sometimes really hard because you left your house but you have belong nowhere sometimes like you're in a country where like they have so much opportunities they're welcoming you like you will feel safe but still like mentally you are thinking of like your family your friends your colleagues on what's happening because in the past 20 years of my life like after like i graduated from university i have started working i had the vision to bring change to my country and to help my people and to be there and to continue my life so that if i say that this is the hardest part even though that not only for me but for hundreds or thousands of other afghans who have fled and who had now in different countries so from what i hear and i understand you are physically there along with your family members but your heart is still in the country where you were born with the people who are still there yes true true and if and sometimes i say that if i didn't live the life there and if they didn't see that progress and that gains in afghanistan then maybe it might be easy for me like to accept what's happening now but with the struggles with the challenges that the people have faced in the past or 20 years i say that it's harder for them to accept what's happening currently in afghanistan that's true so home for you when if i say where is home you already said right now it feels like nowhere For me I still feel that as as you mentioned that if I if I'm physically here but I mentally whenever I start but 
I'm mentally thinking of like my people, my friends, my colleagues. But what gave me really hope, the work that I'm doing, the impact that I see on the small changes that we are making through the organizations or through my advocacy effort in Canada, that gives me hope and it keeps me motivated toward what I'm doing. Um, do your family members also speak English? Because I'm assuming a lot of people who come to Canada and other countries might have language issues and being suitably integrated or feeling integrated in the country where they have come. So for my parents, my dad knows English. So he still, when we arrived, he, he started going to English courses. But for my mom and my brother, she also started learning English. It's hard if I say like when you're in an age of above 50 years old. So it's really hard like to learn a new language, totally new. And for many other families who I know, like their family members are really struggling to learn English. Even if like one of the family members has knowledge of speaking English but for the rest of the family it's hard and it will take time for some people might maybe easy for some people I say it might be hard and, and even impossible to learn a new language that might be hard. Was there an integration program that you and your family went through when you arrived in Canada? If I say like for those who had someone for example could speak English, that was a bit easier for many other families who did not speak English. It was hard for them. The integration process for many Afghans who arrived in Canada, because this process were a quick process, and they were really struggling in terms of integration, even though there were some support available from the government. But those support were not enough because most of the people who have arrived in Canada at the same time the conflict has started in Ukraine that hundreds and thousands of people who also fled Ukraine from the war and that has also come at the same time when there were Afghans coming. So there were not enough support and not enough people who could at least reach to everyone to give support. Many people who had connections, who had network from back their home countries, they could continue supporting each other. But for many other people, it was hard because there were a specific designed programs that somehow were not more effective to many people, for example, to those who are like culturally different, those who could not speak English at all, who are like their first time being out of their own country. If the host country could have done something more, better, let me put it that way, what would that have been besides having more people, more support? I understand that even the host countries are facing logistical issues because of, as you rightly said, because of conflicts in different parts of the world, people are coming from different places to save their own lives. Having said that, in, in Canada, for example, besides having more support people, what else could have been done to make life a little easier or integration process a little easier? One of the issues in terms of integration process, because why it's important, like specifically when the people arrive in their first years. So that's the important part that in the first year, the way that they have been treated, it's also helpful for the host country because if they have not well integrated in their first or second year, it would be hard for them and also for the host country in the future. I don't say that there should be like, more in terms of like quantity to have more opportunities but there should be consider of the quality of the work or quality of the programs or support that's available for the newcomers and that would definitely uh, affect the way that those people are coming through a new country. For example for many people including me like we are all grateful for the support of like Canada or many other countries countries who have supported like Afghans who are at risk in that critical situation. But with this, I can say that they should not be treated the way that, okay, if we have hosted you, if we have brought you in a new country, then you have to be like, for example, grateful for 
what we are offering. So like, it's good that they have to be always listening to what people are struggling. And I think the same things happen in many countries. For example, in Canada, I have experienced that the process were really smoother in 2023 rather than 2022 when the newcomers arrived because after that, many resettlement agencies who are working with newcomers, they or like through the government, they have reached out to the newcomers of uh, they were asking like what support is uh, effective for you, what's not helping you, what you really need. So there should be like continuous monitoring and evaluation process for for the uh, and this would be also effective for the government to consider all these in their upcoming process or they have some lesson learned from what went well, what what didn't went well. So I say like they should consider the quality of the work that they are offering for the newcomers or for refugees in terms of like their integration process. Totally understandable. Did you feel welcome or your family, let me put it that way, generally too? Did you feel welcome? Of course. Of course. I have gone through a lot of difficulties when I have been evacuated from Afghanistan. I have spent two days and two nights in front of Kabul airport and inside Kabul airport. And then I have been evacuated to Kuwait and I have spent 20, 25 days in Kuwait. And after Kuwait, I have been evacuated to U.S. And I have spent 30, 35 days in the U.S. And from the U.S. I have got my visa and I arrived in Canada. So that was not an easy way of getting to a final country and, and many other people have faced the same challenges, the same way of um, not knowing where they will be ending up. But of course, I have been welcomed, like many other people who I have talked with, because when I arrived in Canada, like I have also had some connections back from uh, my work. So I have connected with them. I have tried as much to even to help other families also through the network that I had. So of course, I have been welcomed. So when you and your family left Afghanistan, none of you knew where you will be landing up. You knew that you were getting out. Yeah, so at that time, like the only way that we were thinking of, like that we should get out of Afghanistan, for me and for hundreds of other people, their only hope was to, they didn't know like where they will be ending up. So of course I have applied for, for example, for the Canadian immigration process. And for similarly, I have also applied for different two or three different countries, but I really didn't know like where we will be ending up. It must have been really harrowing, actually, for you and your family, particularly the elderly people and the ones who are really young, both sides, right? Yeah, of course, of course. Like on that time, also managing evacuating my colleagues, which was fortunately many partner organizations have helped more than 25 of my colleagues to get evacuated through that process during the collapse and after the collapse of Afghan government. So I had so much responsibilities on my helping my family members, uh, managing and helping my colleagues, because that was also something that I could not lift that if I'm in danger or if I will be at risk of if I remain in Afghanistan. So the same would be for my colleagues. So we were fortunately be able to also help more than 25 of my colleagues to get out of Afghanistan. Wonderful. And can you share a little about the leadership program that was organized by APT, I think a while ago for Afghan women? Yes. So through different programs that we offer through APT, we are helping young women to both build their critical thinking skills, but at the same time to have an opportunity to engage with their peers in Afghanistan. So through our uh, leadership and mentorship program, we help young women to learn on how to improve their skills and their knowledge and leadership to also sustain hopeful in the current situation and then after that they are completing a full two-month programs then they are writing articles on the current situation of Afghanistan so this would also give them a hope and also a motivation that they should be involved within the current era of what's happening in Afghanistan and they are uh, using their personal motivation and inspiration and also so trying to be involved with what's happening in Afghanistan and then they're sharing those 
knowledge and skills through writing article pieces and then we are sharing those article pieces as an advocacy tool as a powerful voice for the international community to hear and to listen on what's happening for women and girls and also for what's happening in Afghanistan. That's nice. So you are letting their voices, you are enabling their voices to be heard. Now, once their voices are heard, what happens afterwards? Yes. So that's also something that this their voices would help them both to have the attention of the international community to continue working and to continue advocating for them. But beside that also, it's a way for them to open opportunities because the biggest challenge now for educational system is that with the physical ban on education, more of the opportunities which was available online, it's also restricted for women and girls. So this would also an open doors for many other opportunities outside of Afghanistan for women and girls to continue their education online or through scholarships. As far as youth are concerned, I give you a scenario. Say you, from your experience of the number of years and the regimes you've lived through, have certain ideas and thoughts on how things should run. So now I'll give you two parts. From that part where you are and how you think, do you think that different conflicts in the world, including Afghanistan, can always be solved by dialogue? Or do you think at times military action is required? I think if we have see like if you go backward like we saw like in the past 20 years there were like ongoing fighting and conflict happening so that hasn't changed anything we say that conflict or war or like military actions are not the only way of bringing peace or like changing a situation. So there could be other ways. I think in the current situation of Afghanistan, the dialogue engaging people of Afghanistan with the help of, with the existence of the international community could be really effective because we have saw like in the past 20 years, people have lost their lives. But what happened? Nothing has changed. Like if we see that the existence of like international community, different countries in Afghanistan, after 20 years, now everything has uh, got back to like 40 years ago. So now I think in this current situation, we see that dialogue can play an important part in, in resolving the situation or bringing positive and a real change. And would the other generation or the elderly generation in your community also feel the same way? People are really tired of war and conflict. They have lost everything in the past 20 years. And people are really tired. They just, their only hope is for peace. Even though for some people, when I talk to them, they were really tired of like bomb attacks, conflicts, war. So they were hoping that one day there will be peace and they will sleep and they will be in their homes and living in a peaceful society. So for millions of people, they are thinking the same. I know that it's hard because sometimes many people thought that, okay, if someone who could not believe or could not hear through or could not accept through dialogue, so what would be the other scenarios? But people of Afghanistan are really tired of war and conflict. I understand that and I hear that in your voice. How can you represent the youth from what I see? Now you are the face of the youth. How can youth play a part in peace building? We saw like in the past 10 years, there has been lots of progress that the youth brought both nationally, regionally and internationally. So the only way that the youth could continue playing an important part in the society and also in the rehabilitation of the country so that they should give the chance, they should give the platforms and the opportunity so they could continue working and continue building upon those opportunities. In the current situation, the opportunities has 
decreased even to zero. Like people have no opportunity, they have no resources, they have no support for international community. Sometimes we say that they, they're really skilled, they're really talented. They just need someone to look after them. They just need someone to guide them. They will show to the world that they are, they can do anything to change and to create positive change. From what I hear, it seems that they are willing, they are tired of war. They want to do everything they can to take a step forward. They just need a helping hand to lead them to find a way forward. Yes, of course. Do you think that in countries like Canada, the voices of youth are heard? So if I say like, even like in Canada and at some other countries, people, youth are struggling to raise their voices, but they know that there are people, organization, entities that are standing alongside of them. If in case that someone has not responded to them. So they're struggling. It's not that getting things or achieving something is easy. So you have to struggle, you have to work with it. You have to, for example, be with each other. You have to make teams. But the existence of such organization, allies, people could give you hope so you could work on building your vision. Okay, so essentially the difference between Afghanistan and Canada, if I had to just talk about the youth and their voices, would be that both sides are struggling to have their voices heard, except here there are the possibilities of organizations who can lend a helping hand and may be in a position to give the voices to the world and to have some actions taken off from there, right? Yeah, of course so. So in terms of like youth, women and girls, they are everyday struggling, even in a country where there is no war and conflict, but they are raising their voice and making sure that they have access and also equally involved in any decision and any decision that has been made for them and for their future of the country. And we saw that youth has brought money changes so this is what they can change the future for a country when you wake up people use the word word free world the term terminology what does it feel like just that does it feel that i'm hey i'm in a free world i i wake up and i have freedom to be it does that feel like that or still not or you are still under the oppression of what is at the other end? I think we can say that if someone, like if a particular people in a specific country has the freedom, so that means that it's a free world. So I think we want a free world for everyone, those who are like in different parts of countries. It doesn't matter that which region, which ethnicity, or which country they belong to. So we really need a world free of like hate, a world free of like any, any discriminations toward your language, race, ethnicities, or any other particular part. So I think sometimes when we are struggling, when we are advocating for human rights, doesn't mean that we are particularly focusing one specific part. So we have to advocate for any injustices and inequalities happening in any part of the world. Is there a message you would like to leave behind for people in your country? When I say your country, I mean in your heart country and for the rest of the world? I think my message to my people and youth in Afghanistan and also to anyone who are struggling to find a way to continue their motivation and inspiration is that you continue to hold on to help and remain resilient. I think the challenges and the struggles is not always permanent. So there has been always people who are working for you to make changes. So as long as you do not lose hope, so a future, a better future will be possible for you. And also one thing which is always, I say that most of the people is believing that you have the potential to create and bring positive change. And there is always people who are willing to support you so it's it's always good to stay connected to support each other even in the difficult and the tough times and i think the world is watching and they know that what's happening in any part of the world so i think sometimes those hope and resilience 
could be also a motivation and inspiration for many other people who will be struggling in the future. Thank you for listening to the series between the East and the West. Do subscribe to the channels mentioned on the site in case, of course, you liked what you had. I am Meenu Gupta, the host of the series, and I'll be looking forward to your comments. We love feedback. Thank you once again. Namaste and bye-bye.